Welcome to What's New with AWS IoT Greengrass. Today's speakers are James Gosling, Distinguished Engineer, AWS, and myself, Konstantin Dodgkov, responsible for product management. In this session, we will provide a short overview of AWS IoT Greengrass, then we will talk about new capabilities we are launching. After that, you will see a short demo before we conclude the session. We'll start with a Greengrass overview. Let's talk about connected IoT devices. Often, the first challenge in an IoT project is connecting the devices. Then the next step typically is developing the device logic and behavior. Customers develop device software across a variety of software, hardware, and protocol stacks. There is plenty of complexity in implementing the device logic, but as we all know, coding the logic for an IoT device doesn't mean we are done. There are many other challenges customers face when they build IoT solutions. They need to ensure, for example, that the local processing on a device will continue to run even in edge cases, and they won't lose any data, for example, when connectivity gets interrupted. Implementing over-the-air updates is important so that customers can ensure that their device software is up to date and can improve the intelligence of their IoT devices over time. And how about visibility into device health? Once applications are deployed to the edge, how can customers monitor the operations of their applications to make sure that they are up and running as desired? In addition, there are also challenges associated with the management of large device fleets. Customers don't deploy to one device, they deploy their apps to a set of devices and then gradually expand to their entire fleet. Over time, their fleet will continue to grow. So let's see how Greengrass can help you address these challenges. AWS IoT Greengrass helps you quickly and easily build, deploy, and manage intelligent IoT devices. It provides capabilities that virtually every developer needs to implement. Let's see how you can use Greengrass on connected devices. Greengrass consists of two parts, an IoT Edge client software and a cloud service. Using the client software on a device helps customer to add device intelligence through local processing, data management, and machine learning and also helps them to easily connect their IoT devices to AWS services. The cloud service is used for management. It helps customers to remotely deploy and manage IoT applications across their device fleets. Sometimes IoT devices are not directly connected to the cloud. They communicate locally with hubs or gateways, which then connect to the cloud. For these use cases, the Greengrass client software can be also installed on hubs and gateways. Using Greengrass on a gateway enables customers to provide site intelligence, intelligence at the gateway level, for all devices locally connected to the gateway. Also in this, use case, also in this case, Greengrass enables local messaging and processing and data management so that the data from connected devices can be processed close to where it is generated. In this case, Greengrass helps you to, up only to process the data locally and only upload filtered, aggregated, high-value data to the cloud. Greengrass is pre-integrated with a number of AWS services to help you easily connect to these without writing any code. In addition to the pre-integrated services, Greengrass also provides a secure way to connect to any AWS service. Of course, it allows you to connect to third-party services as well. Let's take a look at a summary of key capabilities that Greengrass provides that enable customers to build and manage IoT applications easier and faster. Besides the local messaging and processing that I already mentioned, Greengrass also provides other key capabilities, such as local device shadows that can be 
configured to synchronize with IoT cloud um, device shadows in the cloud, stream manager that enables the management of local data streams and can be configured to automatically upload data to AWS services such as S3 and Kinesis. And also secrets manager that enables customers to securely manage credentials needed to access third-party services, being local systems or other cloud services. Today, a spectrum of customers across different verticals use Greengrass on IoT devices to manage edge operations and connections into AWS. For example, customers are using Greengrass for home automation, connected home healthcare, smart transportation, connected gyms, even smart agriculture, just to name a few. A key learning from customer engagements is that IoT customers are diverse and have very different requirements based on their use cases. They require very flexible services to meet their specific needs. Driven by customer feedback, we are releasing a new version of Greengrass that addresses many of the challenges that I talked about. We are very excited to announce a new major release of Greengrass, version 2.0. Version 2.0 supports additional programming languages, development environments, and provides the flexibility and modularity needed to build, deploy, and manage IoT applications across millions of devices. This update to Greengrass is portable and flexible enough to allow customers to meet their specific IoT requirements. We are also very excited to announce that the Greengrass version 2.0 Edge runtime is now open source. You can go to GitHub to view the Greengrass client software. With that, I'd like to hand over to James to talk in more detail about the new capabilities of Greengrass version 2. So, well, thanks, Constantine. Um, okay, everyone, I'm going to give you a bit of a deeper dive. Um, but I wanted to start with a little bit of terminology and sort of explain the structure of, uh, of Greengrass v2 kind of through the terminology that we use because they, they sort of fit together. So at the, at the very smallest level, there, there are components. Um, and a, a component is really the atomic unit of management. Um, and it can be just about anything, okay? It can be an AWS Cloud Lambda. It can be a Docker container. It can be an OS process. It can be, you know, whatever runtime you'd like to bring along. You, if you want to use Lua or Haskell or something exciting like that, that's fine. If you want to use a, use a, a Debian Snap, that works fine. You can even use uh, KVM virtual machines. And not all components are programs that execute, right? So they, they can be things like runtimes for Lua, Python, whatever. Or they can be um, data files like, like ML models. And every one of these components has a life cycle. They're, they're, they're born. They start up, they get, well, they get installed, they begin to execute, they, they run. For lots of these things, they're just, just going to be running in a st steady state for most of their lives. Some things will run periodically, like once a day, once a month. Um, you can do all kinds of things. Um, sometimes they exit the run state because they're finished. Sometimes they exit the run state because they've had an error. There's error recovery that happens. Um, this, this life cycle is really a, a finite state machine with arcs that connect, you know, where things go. And then within a device, you have a collection of components. Um, and the components 
are, are interrelated from the management structure point of view by a dependency graph. So here the component one has dependencies on component two and component three. So if component one was a Python ML app, it depends on the Python runtime and it depends on the ML model. So if you upgrade the, the Python runtime, run then the app gets restarted. Um, and these, these dependencies can get fairly complicated Usually, it's not too bad. But when you take the, the, the collection of, of a component and the specification of the steps in its life cycle and its dependencies, that's represented by something that we call a recipe. It's just a, it's just a file that describes all of the parts of the component and how they relate to other components. And everything's got versions on it and the dependencies are versioned and, and all of that. So once you take a group of these components, they wrap together and they form a device. And then you take a group of devices and they form a fleet. And then that fleet can talk to the AWS cloud. And there may be a gateway in between, maybe not, but you know, conceptually, it's just talking back to the cloud command. Now, the, the link that connects the device to the cloud is, is often a complex thing. Um, often, it's, it, th there are many different protocols that you want to run over it, many different transport mechanisms. Um, most of the transport mechanisms that most developers see are, you know, based on TCP IP. Um, in some places, they are not based on TCP IP. Um, and the most important issue about that network link from the point of view of people working with it is that it's flaky, and flaky is normal. Um, so we put a lot of effort into making sure that we work well with networks that are somewhat flaky. And there's a special tool that's, that's especially good at handling streaming data from a device back to the cloud, and that's the thing called Stream Manager. It was first introduced last year, and it's got a, a long runway ahead of it. And through over the network link, um, you can talk to almost anything in the AWS cloud. You can talk to S3, or you can stream data to Kinesis. You can talk to IoT Core. You can use... Um, all the usual REST APIs, you can use MQTT. Um, and of course, you, you end up talking to uh, IoT Greengrass, although usually that's actually hidden in um, the, the local SDK. So there were a number of design principles we had when we put this together. Um, and really, it's all about coordination and management of the, uh, the applications on a device. And an important principle was being ruggedly self-sufficient. And, you know, when you're writing a software that runs on a device, it's not in a data center. It doesn't have a friendly IT technician somewhere nearby to give it a kick when it's misbehaving. It really has to be able to self-diagnose, self-fix, self-heal, roll back, yada yada. Everything has to upgrade automatically and on command. Um, and, and do that in a very flexible and non-prescriptive way. Right? So you can use, for instance, whatever MQTT broker you want, if you want one. Right? If you don't want one, then you don't need one. Um, same thing goes for you know, many of the things that, that are sometimes considered features. We just turn them into components. And you plug in the ones that you need, and you don't don't plug in the ones that you don't need. Um, so this is a real, real attempt to, to to embrace you know all the diversity that shows up in in embedded development. And the core the the key thing that we did to to make this happen is we've got this very minimalist core called the nucleus. Um, it has very few directly visible features. All it's doing is coordinating all of these things and coordinating the life cycles and, and all of that. 
and it's really it's really designed around extensibility and being able to 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 build up from that with almost everything being a service and and so this leads us to a number of new new, new capabilities um, in some sense one of the most important is that uh, we now it's a really embraced device de first development um, rather than taking sort of a cloud centric version or, or approach we've uh, tried to make it so that it's much more friendly to device side um, deployment so you can actually uh, install greengrass on a device never connect it to a cloud and do all of your testing and debugging there um, we have a, a, a command line that lets you um, emulate essentially all of the activities you would do from the cloud. Um, we're, you know, we've come out with a, a basic set of, of debugging and testing tools, and that's going to get larger as time passes. Um, and it's really, you know, it's really now about flexibility and, and extensibility. I mean, this the ability to have the execution of model of your choice. You know, if you've got a big machine, and you want to use Docker, use Docker. Docker's fine. Um, whatever programming language you you like, whatever protocols you like, we 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 tried to be you know as neutral as possible, um, and 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 while really making as a sort of a first class concept the the life cycle of these and how to plumb into the the life cycle of you know whatever the actual object is you know if your component is a database we can manage the database um, and we've really worked hard to simplify management for device fleets um, we've added the ability to actually have a concept called a fleet um, or a group and you can add devices to groups you can manage groups you can create new groups you can um, create group, groups that are subsets of other groups and once you've got a group of devices you can send a command to the group and whether it's one device or a million devices they all get that command. So let's do a simple hello world uh, demo. Um, here I am at the, the Greengrass console um, and as I scroll down there's this helpful thing that says set up one core device. So I am going to do that and it's got this series of steps. Step one, give it a name. Um, another, then it's got to add, assign it to a group. I'm just gonna add it to a group that I've already got, test. And then it's got some steps that are about setting up your AWS credentials and getting permissions right. Um, and then yeah, I'm gonna copy this download command. And let's take a look at my shell window here. Um, this SSH gets me into my device. So now I do the download. And I grab the, um, the actual install command. And I'm going to do things a little differently. I'd like to put things in slash opt. Okay, so now it's uh, busily installing, uh, doing a bunch of setup of various users and setting up AWS resources, um, token exchange policies and random other things. Um, and then that's gonna keep setting up all kinds of connections back to the cloud and it's now set up. So now we can say view core devices and there it is. George, status so was reported um, six seconds ago. So it's now running. Um, but in order to do the rest of this demo, there are a few things that I want. So normally what you get is just the, the core nucleus. Um, but there are a couple of tools that I want. Um, one is the command line tool, and the other is there's a, there's a console viewer, which is essentially a, an HTTP server that gets embedded into the nucleus. So I'm going to create a deployment. Um, so let me create one in the demo. Uh, I'm going to send it to a device, George. And 
So now I have to select what things I want to deploy. And I'm going to be picking a few uh, public components. I wanted to I'm going to reinstall the nucleus just, just because uh, I'm going to add the command line interface um, and bug your, the debug console. Um, I'll go back to everything. So I'm doing these three. All right, so I'll hit next. Uh, looks like what I want. So I don't want to fuss with any advanced settings. So I'll go next, um, just to double check. Um, and I'm going to deploy it. So the deployment has been successfully created. And I'm doing the debug console, the nucleus, and the CLI. And if I go and I take a look at viewed within Greengrass, uh, here's George. And so the nucleus has been reinstalled. That's that's fixed. And now I just got to do the other two. There's a funny security thing I have to do. Um, the when when you start the debug console, it it sets up a user ID and password. Um, two says pin slash greengrass CLI. And so here we are. Um, and and you can see that it is running. There are a number of uh, components that are running. There's the main, which is kind of the thing from which everything descends. Um, and you know the most important one that it runs is Nucleus. And because I installed the debug console and the, the CLI, they're here. Um, turns out that the debug console depends on the CLI. So you see this in the, in the graph. Um, so that works out pretty, that looks pretty easy. easy. If I... Um, Take a look at one of these things. Uh, so I'm running the debug console of version 202. And this is the recipe for the debug console. It's it's a little strange um, because it's a it's a plugin, which means that it's a piece of code that actually gets inserted into the nucleus. Um, but you know, most things that people do are not that, um, although you can actually do that. Um, look at the device uh, details. Um, it is a, it's an NVIDIA Tegra AR64. Um, Go back to the dashboard here, and there we have it. We've, we've installed it, and we've installed the, the command line interface, um, and we've installed the, the, the debug, debug console. So now let's do hello world. Okay. A really simple Lua program that just prints out "Hello Moon." Um, there's an interesting little tool for generating uh, Greengrass recipe templates, and that's called GDQT. It isn't actually a part of the the release that's officially out. It's an open source project, kind of on the side. Um, but so GDQT Hello Lua. Now, watch what happens here. Um, you see, it's it's told me where the, the artifacts and recipes are that it's created. And it shows me the command line uh, command that it's uh, executed. And if you see over here on the on the right, this dependency graph just magically changed. And it's changed again. So there's hello. Um, if I take a look at hello, this is the automatically created uh, recipe for my hello world. And it's got a hard dependency on Lua. And if I take a look at Lua, so this is so this has only got a run phase, um, and uh, if I take a look at Lua, it's only got an install phase. So, program plat programming platforms like like Lua or Haskell or Python or or whatever, um, they generally have have just an install and then they then then they do nothing. So if we go back to the, the the dashboard, you see there's that that nice graph that that shows those pieces coming in together. Uh, let's do another one. Uh, Echo there's Frodo and then Sam dot Lua. And now let's quick template to that. And that's done there. The console will update in a moment or two. And there it is.
Now, the interesting thing to look to notice here is that um, Sam also depended on Lua because the template generator generated that that, that template. Um, and both Sam and Hello pointed to the same instance of Lua because their um, their dependencies um, were both um, satisfied by the the same component. So let's see if I've got. So here's another one, and this one. So you see here these these ones are shown as finished because they executed and they did their thing. Um, they don't get removed from the dependency graph because usually there's something like Lua, which um, uh, doesn't do doesn't do anything other than install stuff. Um, so here's a, 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 a hello world done in, in as a shell script. Um, so now if I run to spell and I deploy that, it creates the uses the appropriate templates to generate one that will run a new service called hello. Now this guy, replaces the previous service because they're both called hello and they both have the same version number, or at least it it's guessing the version number from the name. Um, and since I didn't give it any other um, version information, the, it just sort of guesses 0.0.0. .0, .0. It sort of defaults to that. And so one hello 0.0.0, .0 gets replaced by the other hello 0.0.0. .0. So you see this new hello um, doesn't reference Lua anymore because it doesn't have the de that dependency anymore. And you see, it stays running because if you take a look at the shell script, it's just a while through to the time is now date, and then it sleeps for five. Um, if I go and I actually relaunch the the Lua hello, and so it's now installed. the The one that had been running, the one that was a shell script, has gone away. Um, and it's now finished printing hello world, and they, those two now re, uh, reference Lua. So it's a very, very flexible system that lets you do all kinds of crazy things. It's very exciting to see the developer experience of Greengrass v2 and how easy it is to develop Edge software using Greengrass version 2. We're excited that customers are already using Greengrass version 2. Our tracks is a global medical device company and a leading provider of orthopedic products. Artrex is trusting Greengrass for its critical medical devices in operating rooms. Our launch partners, NVIDIA and NXP, already tested Greengrass version 2 on their devices, and these will be listed in the partner device catalog soon. At AWS, we start our customer engagements with a few simple questions. If you knew the state of everything and you could reason on top of that data, what problems would you solve? And how would you solve them differently using intelligent devices? And how would you leverage Greengrass to solve these problems? To get started, you can go to the AWS Greengrass console. You can also use the following resources. To learn how to add intelligence to your IoT devices, go to the Greengrass product page. You can find pre-qualified hardware for Greengrass in the partner device catalog. Or you can use the IoT device tester to test and validate Greengrass on your own hardware. You can also view the Greengrass client software on GitHub. With that, we conclude our session. Thank you so much for your attention.